We are talking today with Barbara Ettinger and Sven Husseby. Barbara Ettinger and Sven Husseby are co-producers of the new documentary film, A Sea Change, which will have its Seattle debut at the 35th Seattle International Film Festival. Start out and tell us what was the motivation in producing your film, A Sea Change? Um, Sven and I are, are married, so we live together. <laughs> And we had just finished a, a film that had taken us five years to make. We were completely exhausted, and we had sworn that we weren't going to make another film for at least another year, just take some downtime, do some other things. And about three weeks into that hiatus, we were reading a magazine, the New Yorker magazine, and uh, we picked up an article that was written by Elizabeth Colbert, and this was back in 2006, November of 2006. And this article was called The Darkening Sea. Uh, and this article described in detail a condition uh, called ocean acidification, which we had never heard of before. Uh, and we like to think of ourselves as, as informed environmentalists. Uh, we've been active for years and years and years in, in environmental issues, and our previous film was based on an environmental incident. Um, but we read this, and we were shocked. We were horrified. Uh, and it, it was such a, a terrifying story, actually, that we didn't even want to believe that it was true. So what we decided we were going to do was find out if it really was true. Uh, and then if it, if it was, we were going to make a movie about it and broadcast it from the mountaintops so that everybody on the planet would be aware of this issue, this condition in the oceans. Because our thought was that if people were aware of this, if they really knew about it, nobody could keep themselves from trying to do something to to resolve it, uh, to uh, to decrease the, the, the amount of CO2 that's going into the ocean, which is basically what ocean acidification is about. It's about the the um, the CO2, the man-made CO2 in the atmosphere that, you know, people imagine it up there in the atmosphere, but what they don't think about is the fact that eventually it's got to come down. And when it comes down, you know, the oceans cover 70% of the planet. So that's an enormous amount of space um, on this planet, and the atmosphere, the CO2 in the atmosphere comes down, and it lands, a large part of it obviously goes into the ocean. When it goes into the ocean, it mingles with the salt water, and it forms carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is what you see in Coca-Cola when you shake up the bottle and it fizzes. And the problem with that in the oceans is when carbonic acid mixes with uh, seawater, salt water, um, it, it prevents calcium carbonate from forming. And calcium carbonate is ubiquitous in ocean water. And it is the element that all shellfish grab from the water in order to build their shells. So all of a sudden, there isn't enough calcium carbonate for lobsters, clams, any kind of shellfish to build their shells. What does that mean? And perhaps I'm going on too long already. No. <laughs> what, what, that, uh, what that means is that any creature uh, that, that eats these shellfish, and for instance, pteropods are little tiny, tiny marine organisms with very delicate shells, but there are, there are billions of these little creatures in the ocean. And these are the creatures that juvenile salmon eat to survive. These are the same creatures that whales eat to survive. If you don't have pteropods because they can't form their shells and they can't survive, all of a sudden you're looking at a potential complete collapse of the food web in the ocean. And that, of course, is devastating uh, to the entire uh, to all living organisms in the ocean, as well as to uh, to ourselves, because 30% of all protein comes from seafood. Uh, so we're looking at an enormous problem. So what is the level of acidification currently, and did you get a sense for uh, what the time scale is, you know, for when things start getting really bad? The, ch the significant changes in ocean chemistry really started when mankind made an unconscious decision, at least that's how I refer to it, uh, to fuel modern life with the burning of fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal. And in doing so, we began to build up a hidden cost, and that hidden cost was the production of CO2. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution, 
approximately the last 200 years, we have increased the acidity of the oceans by 30%. Uh, in terms of pH, that's a fall from 8.2 to 8.1. That doesn't seem like a great deal, but that's a logarithmic scale, just like the Richter scale when you're talking about earthquakes. Uh, more importantly, the number to remember here is the ocean in those 200 years has become 30% more corrosive. And if you want to take um, a little example, uh, if you can still find some chalk around the house, I don't see as much chalk as I used to these days, but if you can find a piece of chalk and put it in a cup of vinegar, you can see the kind of corrosion that occurs when calcium carbonate, which is really chalk, is exposed to um, increased acidity in the water. The amount of of acidification that's occurring is directly linked. It's a simple, simple linkage between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere as measured in parts per million and Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, introduced anybody who went to see it to the concept of parts per million. We're now at about 389 parts per million, which is a, the amount of concentration of CO2. And as that goes up, and it's going up at about two and a half parts per million a year, the amount of acidity increases in a direct relationship in the oceans. Um, what does this mean in 50 years? We're not scientists, but we're told by scientists it means that in that time we could see the extinction of corals on a global basis. Uh, what does it mean in terms of small calcifying organisms? And by that I mean organisms like pteropods, like coccolithophores, like foraminifera. Uh, these are at the base of the food web, as Barbara said earlier. Uh, their um, ubiquitous presence in the oceans is going to decrease. How much? We don't know. We're just starting to learn this. We've re only really known about ocean acidification for seven, eight, nine years. Uh, there were people that hypothesized that that might be the case, but really taking instruments out there and measuring it, that's just in the last uh, less than a decade. And where's the most sophisticated work being done? Out of Seattle, Washington in the United States of America. Seattle because of the NOAA station at Sand Point, and because of scientists at the University of Washington is one of the two or three epicenters of work with ocean acidification around the world. So uh, to stay abreast of this problem, just tune into Seattle. <laughs> and you include some of those scientists in your film, A Sea Change. Absolutely. Um, actually, going back to how we first started to make the film, uh, after reading the article, Sven and I got on the computer and we googled ocean acidification to see if anybody else was doing anything about this. And there was only a single page that came up in 2006, in November of 2006, with six entries. That was it. Just six entries on a single page. But on that single page, there was the announcement of a conference that was going to be held here in Seattle. And there was a name, a Dr. Richard Feely was, uh, was going to be the one who was sponsoring the concert at NOAA. Um, so we called him up and we said, Dr. Feely, you don't know us, but we've just read this article. You were actually mentioned in the article, which he was. Uh, would you mind if we came out to Seattle and attended your conference? Uh, we really need to get a better grasp on this issue of ocean acidification. And we'd like to determine, uh, you know, whether or not uh, we should start making a film about this issue. He said, absolutely. We'd love to have you. Come on out here. So we went to the conference. We attended the conference, which was really just for scientists. It was a large gathering of scientists from around the country who were working on ocean acidification. So it was a very heady, scientifically oriented group. But we sat there for three Oh, actually, that first one was just one day, and listened to the presentations, and at the end, you know, we, we were destroyed. <laughs> the news was terrible. I mean, it was probably worse than we had even imagined, and then hearing it live as opposed to just reading words on a page. 
uh, give you a much uh, more direct impact, I think, in many ways. All of a sudden, it's real. It's real. It's jumped off the page, and it's it's real. It felt visceral. It felt very visceral. So uh, at the end of this uh, conference, we approached Dick, Dick Feely and said, Dick, would you mind if we made a movie? And if we do, would you help us? And he said, Thank you, thank you, thank you. He said, you know, we have been working on this for years, and we're not spokespeople. That, that's not what we do. We don't even have an avenue uh, through which to communicate to the public what's, what's going on scientifically. And in addition to that, you know, at that point, we were in the midst of an administration that really didn't give much credence to science. So they were extremely frustrated in not being able uh, to communicate um, on a broad level to people about what was going on, what their discoveries were. So um, he opened up his, you know, Rolodex, old-fashioned word, but basically, you know, his address book <laughs> to us. Uh, and he told us, okay, this scientist, this scientist, this is what they're doing here in Norway, this is what they're doing in Svalbard, this is what they're doing in Alaska, and basically helped us set up our uh, agenda, uh, our logistics for who we were going to go to and who we were going to speak to. And um, coincidentally, and this is how our, our narrative was formed, all of these places that he mentioned were very familiar, both to Sven and myself, and that was largely because these were the places that Sven had grown up and then moved to when he was six years old and then moved to again when he was 11 years old. So it followed Sven's personal story as being a, a young child born into a family that owned a fish store in Oslo, Norway. And then his father accepted the position of running a salmon cannery uh, on a small peninsula in Alaska. And then when his mother got frustrated because he wasn't in school and said, we've got to go to Seattle, my child's got to go to school, they picked up and left the salmon cannery and moved here to Ballard, where Sven spent uh, uh, until you were, how old? Until college. Until, until college. 18. So he was, yeah, until he was 18 years old. But all the time living amongst a fishing community, always within a community that relied on fish. And not only relied on fish, but whose very culture uh, was entwined with, you know, the mythology of the sea. So he seemed and to be... And the bounty of the sea. And the bounty of the sea, yeah. So Sven, clearly in, in my mind, was the perfect character <laughs> to move us through this story of ocean acidification, going from science-based to science-based to, to visiting artists, but in these very places that Sven had spent such important years of his life. But then I think what you added to that that made me a little apprehensive, but at the same time it turned out to work, I think, very well, was that you suggested that this had to be about legacy. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Well, I think it was really watching, watching Sven uh, with our grandson, uh, who lives on, on the coast in California, and watching them together, you know, watching both of them expressing pure joy. But little Elias, our, well, who, he was five years old at the time when we first started filming. Watching him with that sense of wonder that we've all experienced, you know, our first visits to the ocean, our the first time being chased by a wave, you know, our first time seeing a dolphin. I mean, these are momentous times in our life that fill us with hope and wonder and awe and make us inquisitive. We want to know more about the natural world. How did that happen? Where did that come from? It's such an exciting time. And Sven teaching Elias uh, about what he knew so well, which is the ocean and the fish and its bounty and its mythology, it just, you know, struck us both. Oh my God, you know, this is what we're, we're, we're up against. This is what, what we might be letting go uh, if we allow the oceans to become acidic and for life in the ocean really to be diminished. All of a sudden, this, this beautiful sense of wonder, this, this, uh, this sense of pure joy, uh, it, it won't be there anymore. This, this opportunity for Sven to share his knowledge, to pass it down from generation to generation, might vanish. Uh, and what about our own responsibility so that he can uh, understand what Sven has known his entire life and wants to pass on to him? I mean, and our responsibility to maintain the ocean so that they will be the same as they were when Sven was growing up. I mean, all of these issues were weighing very heavily on us. And, uh, and we thought, well, this is a beautiful way uh, to illustrate these very points by showing this beautiful, intimate relationship. Um, so 
so we included him. Yeah, I think it works very well, having just watched your film last night. In fact, just the opening sequence is great with, in an aquarium somewhere. I wasn't Monterey, sure. Monterey Bay Beautiful aquarium. aquarium. Yeah. Is carbon dioxide the only contributor to acidification in the oceans? Yes. Um, I mean, there are other pollutants. When, when you talk about the oceans and the conditions of life in the oceans, uh, well, let's talk about fish, because I think uh, here in the Northwest, people are quite concerned about salmon, salmon runs, and salmon off the coast here and down into Oregon and Northern California. And we have seen a significant decrease, or some might call it a collapse, of the fisheries over the last 15 to 20 years. And the rate of collapse is increasing uh, on a geometric scale. And there are probably four factors that have been involved. One is the warming of the water, which is driving the fish further north. Two is the pollution from runoff, uh, agricultural chemicals, uh, industrial chemicals, whatever. Um, three is what I might call uh, industrial fishing or forms of harvesting fish. Notice I'm not saying fishing, I'm saying harvesting fish that uh, change the rules of the game. Uh, and four, something that only now is beginning to be understood, which is this increased acidification of the water itself. In other words, creating more challenging conditions for the fish, in this case, the marine organisms. Um, so, you know, this, this is the big issue um, that we're looking at here. And it's, as I said earlier, it's, uh, it's high school level chemistry. It's CO2 going into the atmosphere. Uh, Americans are putting out 40 pounds of carbon in the form of CO2 per day. We're putting 22 million tons of carbon in the form of CO2 into the oceans every day on a global scale. And that is creating carbonic acid, which is then lowering. I mean, it, it's just so hard to imagine that with the oceans, the surface area is 70% of the globe, but then you have a, this vast depth of the oceans. So the sheer volume of the oceans themselves is so grand that, you know, it. At least for me, it's very hard to understand that we could put anything on a scale that would alter what that chemical mix is. But the reality is we have. We can now measure it. And the answer is yes, it's from carbon dioxide. And the current known primary contributors to carbon dioxide are industry, Cars. automobiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cement plants. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Uh, home heating air conditioning, uh, and then various things go down from there. But it's primarily the burning of oil, coal, and natural gas. Also in your film, you include at uh, the end, you talk with multiple people who are working on from all different angles on dealing with this carbon mess and uh, solutions to that. Can you briefly touch on that? We talked with several people. Um, one is Miyoko Sakishita, who's an environmental lawyer with the Center for Biological Diversity. And uh, you may have seen um, some press on her activity recently. If you read that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has been sued, uh, and its response to that pressure, that suit was uh, launched by the Center for Biological Diversity out of San Francisco. Uh, their response has been that they are now um, going to classify CO2 as a pollutant. Uh, they're being sued under the Clean Water Act, and CO2 is acting is perceived as acting as a pollutant to decrease the level of pH lower than was found acceptable under that act when it was written. Uh, how far this will be sustained, I don't know. I'm sure it will be challenged in a variety of 
of courts, but it's certainly bringing attention to ocean acidification, and uh, this suit has gotten a lot of publicity. If you Google it, you'll learn much, much more. Also and the Endangered Species Act. Exactly, uh, because it's affecting organisms. It's actually the Clean Air Act they're using, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. Um, in addition, we spoke with um, Andrew Beebe, who was in charge of the installation of the seven acres of solar panels on the roofs of uh, Google he corporate headquarters in Mountain View, California. Uh, it's extraordinary. They generate 30% of their load uh, from those solar panels. Uh, they have plug-in Priuses there. Uh, that uh, employees can check out, uh, employees that don't have cars for uh, short-term needs. You want Elias to get a job there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a work environment. I, I couldn't believe I mean, it. They were having fun. I mean, they were really having fun, and it was palpable. Uh, it, there's, there's a reason why Fortune magazine declares them one of the ten most uh, happy workplaces in America. Um, we spoke with um, engineers in Norway who are uh, doing beta testing of floating wind generators off the coast in the North Sea. Uh, we spoke with uh, a very young uh, gentleman who's in charge of clean tech investments for Sequoia Capital, uh, which is the venture capital firm out of Palo Alto that was one of the funders of Apple, one of the funders of PayPal, one of the funders of Google, one of the funders of um, Yahoo. I mean, what I'm trying to point out here is that it's a venture capital firm that's had a terrific track record. And they are now a big player in A123, which is the major uh, battery producer for cars uh, out of Watertown, Massachusetts, a bunch of MIT graduates. Um, and their excitement about turning the corner on this, turning the corner on CO2, uh, creating, if you will, a new way of looking about um, finding energy to move forward. Uh, it was exciting, and I needed that because uh, halfway through the film, it was getting darker and darker and darker, and it doesn't take a lot to push a Norwegian into darkness. Uh, we know darkness. Uh, but meeting those people was very hopeful, and um, I think about them every day. I really do, and I stay in touch with them because um, every day we learn more. And I think what is the hardest to deal with is the fact that every scientist we have been working with and talking with is telling us that the data they're finding is showing that what they are projecting based on what they thought they knew, the data is showing them that change is happening faster than they had anticipated. But there are a number of real optimists in that gang as well. Well, that's, that's true. But I, I want to make one more point, if I can, Barbara, and that is that um, the issue here isn't so much the amount of acidification today, it's the rate at which we're getting and going beyond that amount. It's a rate of change that the world hasn't seen since the KT extinction period 65 million years ago. The creatures and, don't have an opportunity to adapt. There's yeah, not enough time to adapt. For what to they the call evolutionary adaptation. Yeah. And that's what um, the scientists we've been listening to find most worrisome. It's the rate of change. Do you want to mention the, all the other Seattle-based people? Yeah. Like Brad and Ed. Yeah. Well, the, the, the people we've worked with here in Seattle that um, I hope get more attention in the Seattle area because, A, they deserve it, B, because they're major players in, in this, on a global scale in this whole issue of ocean acidification, are people like Dr. Richard Feely, Dr. Chris Sabine, who works hand-in-hand -hand with them at NOAA and at the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Edward Miles, who's a policy specialist uh, for oceans, who's also based at the University of Washington. And Brad Warren, uh, who's a consultant to the large corporate um, fishing companies. 
and it's very interesting because I have a lot of empathy for fishing companies uh, in that they have been, I think, colored by many as bad guys in terms of their practices, which have not been seen as sustainable. But they understand that they want to be able to continue to operate in the long term. And if they're going to do so, they need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem when it comes to fish populations. And so it, we uh, screened the film at the Seafood Summit down in San Diego in February, which was made up of uh, representatives of the fishing industry from around the world, as well as NGOs, as well as scientists. Very interesting chefs. mix. And chefs. Uh, and there is, if I can use the term, a sea change in the way these groups are seeing it. And people like Brad Warren are playing a very important role in standing with one foot in the world of science, though he's not a scientist, he's a journalist by training, and one foot as someone who speaks to the corporate fishing community. And that's a very, very important bridge. And... Um, I think it's it's interesting to see that. I mean, I, I take that as a very optimistic um, sign down the road yep. because they're big players, they're important players, and they have an impact in Washington. Yep. With that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you both for coming in and spending time with us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.